Jojo, you ready? Stand up, boy. Hold down that Spencer rope. Hey, let's bow our heads tonight. Let's just go before the Lord, ask him to bless our evening. Father, we want to do things your way. And we ask you, Lord God, that as we lift up your name, Lord, that you draw each one of us close to you. And Lord, that you'd come close. Lord, this is a thin place because it's a place for decades, almost a century, that your name has been lifted up and glorified, God. And we will continue that, Lord, till you return. We will continue to give you praise in this house. Father, come near to us tonight. We know that when you're near, Lord, that things change for the better. Lord, your plans for us are always good. They're for a future and hope. So we glorify your name, God, not only for the good things that you do, but most importantly, for the awesome God that you are. We proclaim that you are King of kings. You are Lord of lords. And you are our King. We worship you, Jesus. It's in your mighty name we pray. We lift it up. Amen. Fill you through it. 
Israel and the children of Israel were preparing to leave for their promised land, the Lord instructed them to kill a lamb. And that lamb's blood was supposed to be on the doorpost of their home. And when the spirit of death passed over, he said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. So when Satan comes, and he's going to, he will see that you are cleansed by the precious blood of the Savior of God. And, <laughs> and you are sealed with the promise of God. Can't touch you. Christ alone. My hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, the solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love
church. Amen. Amen. Glory to your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and have our seats tonight. Amen. We have an awesome privilege, church. We do. It's an awesome privilege that we have. This side of glory, we get to join the everlasting chorus. And even as our word of prophecy came out this morning, we are to never stop praising the name of Jesus. His word says, let his praise continually be in our mouth. And what are we doing when we're praising the Lord, church? We're warring, right? Amen, we're warring. We are proclaiming who's king. And when we do that and when we proclaim the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee bows, every tongue confesses, amen? He is Lord of lords. I don't know about you. Actually, I do, because I know most of you pretty well. But we need Jesus. I need Jesus. You know, uh, something that has come out of this pulpit so many times um, is that the closer that I get to him, the further I realize he is away, how big God is and how much he loves us. Without his love in church, without a revelation of his love, you ain't got it. You ain't got it because we love him. Why? Because he first loved us. Amen. And his love has been shown so many times in so many ways. You just have to have eyes to see it. Amen. And he's showering us with his love. When we come and we enter into his presence, we experience the love of God. His mercy, his grace, his unending and unfathomable love is found and experienced in his presence. See, we have the greatest blessing. That's how I started that out. We're pretty privileged. We have the greatest blessing because what he commands us to do, he provides a great blessing with. And every commandment of the Lord has a blessing tied to it. And vice versa, every blessing of the Lord that you want to walk in, you have to obey. There's a piece of obedience. Amen? Amen? Well, I'm just loving God. I believe you are too. That's why you're here. We're going to have a great evening uh, message tonight. I'm looking forward to that. Um, if you didn't get a chance to give, uh, there's plates in the back. Make sure you drop uh, your, your, your gift in there and, and make sure to do that. Don't, don't cheat yourself out of a blessing. Amen. Uh, we want to be a part of God's kingdom. And that's one of the ways that we do that each and every week. I don't want to come to the house of God and never bring anything. The awesome thing about knowing God is that he blesses us so that we are a blessing. Amen, church. And uh, this is the house you're fed in. Amen. So bring that tithe into the storehouse and then listen to the unction of the Lord as he puts it on your heart to give more. Amen. Amen. Monetarily, time-wise, all that. Amen. He's given you great and precious promises. Amen. And his plan for us is to uh, not only inherit salvation, but uh, uh, to, to have the kingdom. Amen, church. To have the kingdom, the blessings of the kingdom, they're for us. Amen. Amen. Let's pray, and then I think we're going to transition. Have a great evening tonight. Father, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your presence, your awesome presence. Lord, you set us right every time. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness, and we proclaim it tonight in this house, God. You are faithful, and you are great, and there is none like you. Lord, I pray that as your word is spoken tonight, Lord, that it, it does not fall on deaf ears or hard hearts, Lord, but it falls on ears that, that are longing to hear your word, and it, and it falls on the fallow grounds or, or the, 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 the good ground of our hearts, Lord God, that it would uh, be that seed that's sown tonight, Lord God, that brings forth great fruit. Lord, we want to be fruitful as well. You're faithful. We want to be faithful. And, Lord, your blessing in our life is so evident, and we want to be fruitful in our lives, Lord God. So prune us, make us. Have your way with us tonight. We are here for you. We want to hear your word. We bless your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's welcome Pastor Jim. Yeah. Let's welcome the Holy Ghost. Thank you for that. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. You ready for the word tonight? 
do a Bible study. Kind of unique how God does things, you know. Uh, Pastor taught an awesome message on, on the covenant, and we had a great communion service this morning. Amen? And uh, <laughs> so uh, we're going to talk about the significance of the blood tonight. But it's kind of unique how God kind of weaves things together. We don't really talk about everything. Although I did ask you, I think, this morning what you were going to preach on. And you said covenant because we were doing communion. Or no, yeah, communion. And then my wife, I didn't tell her I was going to do the blood. And she had all these blood songs. So that's, that's how you know the Holy Ghost is working. Come on. Amen. And so we're going to talk about the significance of the blood. How many of you know, uh, without a doubt, the most valuable gift that God has given to the church besides our Savior Jesus Christ was his death, burial, and resurrection and the blood that he shed on the cross. And I'm not going to go through all the seven places tonight because that would keep us here all night long. But one of these times we'll uh, do a more in-depth on the blood and we'll talk about all the various places that Jesus shed his blood on the way to the cross. Amen. Uh, there was quite a few things. And, and each one of those places that Jesus shed blood on his way to the cross is significant in type and shadow for what Jesus has done to us in our salvation. How many of you understand that our salvation is based upon the blood of Jesus Christ? Amen. And so we're going to get into that. And we're going to talk about the value of the blood. And this will go, like I said, right along with pastors teaching on the blood covenant. Amen. And uh, uh, one of the things that, that the blood is to us is it is, it is a weapon of warfare. You know, the Bible tells us to put on the full armor of God, amen, and then uh, Ephesians 6, 18, where he talks about all the, the various things about uh, uh, the armor. He talks about also prayer. I see prayer, even though it doesn't call it that in the Bible, I see prayer as the javelin you throw at the devil, amen, the spoken word that Jesus given us the right to speak his word. But on, on, on top of that, he's given us the blood. And so we're going to go through this tonight. Uh, you know, we sing that song, you know, one of my favorite songs is, and I don't, it doesn't matter if my wife sings it or my sister-in-law, uh, Donna, comes here. I always make them sing the blood. Love the blood, amen. It's like, when I die, if I die and don't go in the rapture, I want that sung at my funeral, and I know it will be, but I'm, I'm, I'm believing for the rapture. <laughs> but uh, it's like my favorite song, because it means everything. Amen? It means everything to me. And we're going to find out that uh, in warfare, if you really understand what he taught this morning about covenant, how that you are in covenant with Almighty God through Jesus Christ, and you understand the blood, I mean, one of the elements that we use uh, with the grape juice or in the old days, the wine, was that represented the blood of Jesus Christ. And he inaugurated that new covenant in his blood. So the blood of Jesus is so powerful and we sing songs concerning the power of the blood, but few, few of us experience the, the real power of the blood or the understanding of what the blood of Jesus is about. We go around and we say, well, I plead the blood. How many of you ever heard old Pentecostals or anybody? I mean, any, any believer, uh, you know, worth their salt has heard sister speak in tongues or brother spiritual, la la, plead the blood. And you know what? It's very powerful, especially when those folks do it because they understand it. And I mean, demons, if you don't know this, demons hate it when you start talking about the blood of Christ. I mean, you can stir up a nest of them, boy, when you start talking about it. And I'll tell you what really is effective is when you understand the power of the blood and the power of the covenant. Amen. Once you know that and you understand that it's not your power, it's not by your might, but it's by the power of the name of Jesus. And that name conveys the fact that he shed blood for all mankind. And those that have put their faith and their trust in him have been bought and back and have been reconciled unto God. And it's through that blood that we were born again. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. So what is the value of the blood to us? You'll never enjoy the full benefits uh, of being a Christian until you give the blood of Jesus its rightful place in your life. Go over to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. We're going to start out there. And I know pa some of these scriptures I think Pastor might have hit on a few of them this morning. Amen. And I think I want to go to... You know, the book of Hebrews is pretty powerful. I mean... 
a lot of people go, well, this is just to the Hebrews. No, there's a whole lot of stuff jam-packed in there for us, too. Yeah. Don't forget, I know there is the nation of Israel, and that covenant is still in place with those that are not born again. Uh, when they become born-again uh, Christians, then they enter into the covenant that we're in. But our covenant is based off that covenant. And then in Christ, we also have the blessing of Abraham also, the promise of the Spirit by faith. Amen? And so we tap into the root as the wild olive tree, and we get the benefits uh, of their covenant. But we have a new and better covenant based on better promises. Amen? Yep. And so not only the benefit of that, but the benefit of what Jesus has done. And, and understand this about covenant too. Our covenant with God is based on Jesus Christ. He made the covenant with the Father, and in the last will and testament, He passed it on to us. And so that's, that's an awesome thing. And, and uh, with that in mind, what is the value of the blood? Well, Hebrews 9, let's start at verse 20. Saying this is the blood of the testament which God has enjoined unto you. Moreover, Talking about Moses, he sprinkled blood both on the tabernacle and on the vessels of ministry. Now listen to this. And almost all things are by law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. And why is that? Because sin requires a death. You know, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, uh, and they said, well, we, we're naked. And God goes, well, who told you you're naked? Well, they, I don't, they, they weren't talking about their physical parts. They were talking about the fact that they'd lost the glory of God that covered them. Okay? And man was naked without the, co the covering of the glory of God all the way up until Jesus Christ came on the scene. Amen? Now we're covered with the glory again. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is a glorious church. We're not going out as a ragtag fugitive fleet, as Pastor and I like to say, based on an old uh, show, Battlestar Galactica. But uh, we're going out, amen, as the glorious church. And, and here's the deal. I'm cooperating with the grace of the Holy Spirit, but it is the blood of Jesus, amen, that cleanses me from all spot and wrinkle. Because he's going to present to himself. And I just got to cooperate. You just got to cooperate, amen? But all things are purged by blood. So when Adam and Eve sinned, the first thing God did is he slayed an animal. And it doesn't say that he scraped it and tanned the hide. He put it on them, and it was bloody. He covered them with that animal's skin. And there you had the first starting of the animal sacrifice. Uh, the thing with Cain and Abel is that Cain, he tilled the ground. He worked hard, man. He did some really good stuff on the ground. Remember that the ground was cursed with thorns and thistles? So he really had to work hard. And there's his brother Abel out there tending the sheep. You know, I know that there's a job in that, but I don't think it's as, as tough as tilling the ground, amen? And he got jealous about that, but Abel either had a revelation or he just was doing something right. And when he brought his offering to the Lord, he brought a, he brought a lamb and they slayed it. And, and that blood was shed for sin. Yeah. I mean, from the earliest uh, times, man knew that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Because uh, sin is, is a death sentence. Yeah. Okay? And you talked about the scriptures, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you, amen? The Passover was based on that idea that uh, started clear back into the garden. Saying, this is the blood of the testament which God has enjoined, and immorally sprinkled the blood both on the tabernacle and all the vessels of ministry, and almost all things uh, by law are purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. So listen to this, verse 23. It was also therefore necessary, okay, in light of the patterns that Moses used in the tabernacle, okay, Jesus, being a better high priest, he says, therefore it was necessary that the patterns of the things in heaven should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifice. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are a figure of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Okay, so when Jesus Christ, and we don't know exactly, so I'm going to kind of give you my idea of it, 
Okay? I don't know if an angel got below the cross and gathered up, you know, the blood. And I know there's a guy out there that says the Ark of the Covenant's under the hole where the cross was in in a crack and the blood went down on the mercy seat where the Ark of the Covenant was hidden. I don't believe it. I don't know if that's true, but I don't believe it. But I believe this. I believe even though they stuck that spear in Jesus' side and blood and water came out because they punctured that pericardial sac around his heart, amen, as he was distressed hanging on that cross. But even so, they hurried up and took him in and put him in the, in the burial chamber and threw a few spices on him, wrapped him up because Sabbath was coming. And they, can't, they weren't allowed to do things. So the women were, were planning on coming back after the Sabbath and properly doing their due diligence to the body of Christ. But when Jesus rose from the dead and he told Mary, don't touch my feet, don't grab a hold of me, I got to ascend up into heaven. Well, when he went up into heaven, the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews that he did the same thing Moses did, but in the tabernacle in heaven, not made with hands, and he sprinkled his blood. They would go in there, the priest would go in and sprinkle it seven times. Jesus went into the holy tabernacle in heaven, which, which was a place where God and man would have uh, uh, been able to meet, and we weren't able to do it until Jesus went up there and cleansed it. I believe he stuck his hand in his side because there was still blood in there. They hadn't, they hadn't desanguinated him yet. That's my opinion. We'll find out I'm right when we get to heaven. <laughs> That's my opinion. But, the, but it is biblical that Jesus took his blood and sprinkled it. So if an angel got it in the Holy Grail and took it up there, I don't know. But I, I believe he was the Holy Grail, if you will. Can you say amen? So he still had to go into the heavens and cleanse that place where God and man spiritually could meet. Amen. And so the blood cleansed that area. Uh, so there's no forgiveness or remission of sins without the shedding of blood. Now... Do we need to do that now when we sin? No, because the blood of Jesus never loses its power. And symbolically, however it is, symbolically or otherwise, whether there's a cup up in it, I don't know all that stuff because the Bible isn't real clear. But I know this, that what Jesus did, the finished work he did, was enough to cleanse you from all your sin every day until you die uh, as long as you go to the Father and you do the first John 1 9, if we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How does He cleanse us? He cleanses us because of what He did with the blood. That blood stands as, a, as an ensign to you and I that we can always find forgiveness at the feet of Jesus. Now, we're not going about trying to sin, but how many of you know we're in this flesh and we do do that? But you know that. That is not our bent anymore because we're a new creation reality. Amen. Amen. But the blood never loses its power. So number one, the blood is for salvation and redemption. I'll read you some scripture. You can write it down and, and look at it further in context. In Ephesians 1, 7, it says, In whom we have redemption through his blood. He paid the penalty through his blood being shed. And the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. How many of you know grace is unearnable favor? The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8, We're saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The blood of Jesus was given to cleanse all those that would come to Jesus and acknowledge Him as their personal Lord and Savior, whom they would come before and say, Lord, I'm a sinner and I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Be my Lord and Savior. I believe that you are the Messiah, the only name given under heaven whereby a man must be saved. Amen. And when we acknowledge Jesus, and maybe you don't know all those words when you first get born again, but basically most of us know you've got to confess your sin. I don't mean we've got to go through the list. we just got to go, I'm a sinner, God in need of a Savior, and I believe Jesus is that, that uh, provider for my sin, and He shed His blood on my behalf. Amen. Amen. And in pastors, uh, all of us here and out there, we need to make sure we teach that on a regular basis. I so appreciate that teaching on the covenant. Amen. We need to understand that our covenant is made through the blood of Jesus. And here we go. Here's another one. Okay, so... We have redemption through His blood and forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Unearnable favor. Uh, number two, peace. Colossians 1.20. 
And having made peace, what? Between us and God. You know, when the angels came and they said, you know, peace on earth and goodwill to men. What did that? Well, we know there isn't no peace in the earth, is there? That peace that they were proclaiming was peace with God through Jesus Christ. Through this little baby that's born, there will be an opportunity for all mankind to have peace and reconciliation between God and man. Amen. And Jesus would be that celestial (laughs) go-between between God and man. Uh, you know, I'm, one time I was talking about the Sistine Chapel and I got somebody upset at me because they thought it was the most beautiful thing in the world. I thought they need to put some clothes on those folks. <clears throat> and there you had man with no clothes on and God with no clothes on, kind of a little loincloth. And man is reaching up to God and, and God is reaching down to man, but they're not connecting. Yeah, I'm like, I want to grab that painting and go... And put those hands together, amen. And, and that person got kind of upset at me because they really loved art and everything. Well, I wasn't trying to denigrate it. It was just, I thought, you know, it wasn't depicting what Jesus did for us. How that he, he helped us reconnect with God, amen. Yeah, there was a time we were separated like that, although I think they had clothes on. Anyway, togas or something. <laughs> uh, I got to be a little funny. It's just me. So having made peace through the blood of his cross by him, talking about Jesus, to reconcile all things unto himself by himself, I say whether they be things in earth or in heaven. Amen. Jesus is cleansing all things through that blood. You know, the end result of all this is a new heaven and a new earth. Amen. There's the thousand year millennial reign that's coming up not too many years hence. How many of you understand that? We are probably most likely the generation that will see the rapture of the church take place. You need to be right with God. You need to be looking for Jesus. The Bible says he's going to return for those that are looking for him. And I wish we'd all be ready because I believe rapture is a reward for readiness. Now, if you're a Christian and even if you're not totally ready and you die, uh, depending on where you're at, uh, you're going to heaven. But if you're out playing the harlot and running around doing crazy things and God is like fifth on your list, I don't know. I wouldn't want to be in that position when the rapture takes place. Now, I hope I'm totally wrong and you can just live any way you want after you ask Jesus in your heart and go to heaven. But somehow, I don't feel that in my heart and I don't see it in Scripture. I don't mean we got to be perfect in and of ourselves, but I think we got to be striving to to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. Amen. we got to be dedicating our lives to the Lord. Some do it 30, some do it 60, some do it 100. But you got to be somewhere in there. That's what the Bible says. So that we may prove, Romans chapter 12, what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God? Or according to Mark 4, 30, 60, and 100 fold return. That's what I believe. That's what I believe the scripture teaches. But I'd rather preach it a little bit more strict like that than to be going well jesus loves you just go out and do whatever you want you're covered you're you're eternally saved and you can't lose your salvation well i'm wondering if you live like that whether you truly ever were born again because even though i was a rank sinner at one time doing all kinds of crazy things by the time i asked jesus in my heart stuff started changing to the point of after 50 years of walking with the Lord up and down, yo-yoing around, I, I, I'm not the per- I can't even believe I was that person. Yeah. Amen. There's some aspects of him that was okay, but for the most part, I'm glad I am who I am now. Amen. And uh, I've I got to be careful, and so do you, that I don't go back and kind of, you know, have remorse to the point. You know, we'll get on that one too, but sometimes uh, you look back at things you did and you just go, golly, God, I was so dumb. I was so blind. How could I have done those things? I should have listened to my sweet little mother. Amen. <laughs> Thank God for godly mothers and godly wives. Amen. And if you got godly sisters and godly girls, you got it made. You got a conscience everywhere you turn. Yes. Got up this morning and I, I'm going right out from the house with my extra hundred pounds of fat to get in my car without a jacket on. And I got my mother giving me a hard time, my daughter giving me a hard time, and my wife giving me, where's your jacket? <laughs> I'm like, I'm all right, girls. I got a hundred pounds of blubber to keep me warm. <laughs> More than you got. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. 
Thank God for our mothers and our daughters and our wives. So peace with God. How many of you know that? You got peace with God today. Amen. So you, may, you may not have peace in your heart. I don't know what, what all's going on in your head or what's happened to you that, that keeps bubbling up. But I want you to know we've got to begin to focus back on the scriptures when we're feeling like that. And if, if something's bothering us, we need, to, we need to check in with the Holy Spirit and go, you know, what am I missing here? You know, and if you're like me, you always feel guilty even if you're not guilty, right? My wife goes, you'd feel guilty if a, if a dog died down the street and you had nothing to do with it. Because that's kind of how you are when you're number one son. It's always your fault, right? But anyway, we can't be like that with God. We got to be assured of our salvation. God does not want you walking around letting the devil or your crazy head telling you on a daily basis how bad you are, how far away from God you are. Let me tell you, once Jesus came into your heart by the Holy Spirit and you were born again, He's never going to leave you or forsake you. Amen. He's there in the background, and He's not always yelling at you. No. He's not always berating you. He's, in fact, He's never doing that. He's not telling you what a, what a low life you are. That's your own self-talk or the devil, amen? Kick the devil out and tell your old self to be quiet. Come on. Amen? amen? I have to do that on a daily basis. All right, number three, entrance into the presence of God. Oh, hallelujah. Man, when you read the Old Testament, you see that there's only a few people like Moses or Joshua or David or Samuel. Not the general run of the mill of, uh, of you know, believers in that day got to have a personal relationship with God the same way just a few of them did. Amen. God wanted that. If you read, I think, it, is it Exodus 16, 19, and right in there, you'll see where, where God just seems like he kind of steps out of time and goes forward, and then he goes, oh, wait a minute. Don't let him come to the mountain. <laughs> and then he goes, oh, bring him up. And, and, and Moses goes, they can't come up, God. And he goes, oh, get away from me. He's upset about it because God's desire from the day that he created man was to have sweet fellowship yeah. with us. Yeah. And we're living in a day now where we can come into his presence. It is so good to wake up in the morning and know that I got God with me. Yes. You know, there was a day where I was backslidden. There was a day where I was, was running from God and I never felt good. I always felt like I needed to look around. Somebody was going to bop me on the head, you know, spiritually speaking, I'm saying. Because I knew what was right and what was wrong. My mother taught me, took me to church when I was a little boy. But I just never bowed my knee fully to the Lord at that time. But yet in here I knew that I needed to give my heart to the Lord, but I still wanted to play crazy. Right? And, and, and so I, was ne I never felt right. I always felt condemned. I always felt like I was lost or something. I, can any of you... Can any of you identify with that? I just felt like I was lost. I'm not just talking about lost, going to hell. I just, I just, there was a part of me that just wasn't settled, just wasn't right. Oh, but when Jesus came into my heart, Amen. when I went to my mother-in-law's church and uh, bowed my knee to Jesus Christ and he came into my heart with little, little sister Moore and, and little sister McCamish. Come out of him, devil! Get him, Jesus! Come out of him, devil! Get him, Jesus! Somehow I prayed through, and I got born again, and a week later, I, I, was, I was in a service because they had this long, ongoing revival, and, and I remember Brother McCamish came by me and touched me, and I went on the floor and got filled with the Holy Ghost, and uh, from then on, it was like I'd get the gifts of the Spirit would start bubbling up in me, and I didn't know what they were, but it was a, it was a journey and an adventure from then on with God, and I got such a hunger in my heart to read the scriptures and to understand spiritual things, amen? I just, there'd never been anything in my life that I was ever turned on to, you know, when I was a sinner, except for the things that I shouldn't have been turned on to. And uh, man, once I, once I found out about God's word and I got into it, and I could actually understand it when I read it. It was like, I just devoured it for years. All I did was read the Bible, read books pertaining to the Bible, take notes, listen to sermons, until I was filled up with, with the knowledge and the wisdom and the Word of God. Amen? And, and I felt so good. How many of you know? Amen. Even though there's junk going on, if you'll just stop and refocus yourself, recenter yourself, and just let that blood of Jesus yeah. cleanse you, yeah. you you'll, you'll know, well, you know what? No matter what's going on out here, I'm going to heaven. Amen. 
Jesus said, you know, when the disciples went out, the 70 went out, and he gave them anointing, power, and authority to go out and cast out devils, heal the sick. When they come back, you know, they're like rejoicing because of all the cool things God was doing in their personal ministries. And Jesus said, well, I saw Satan fall as lightning. He says, don't rejoice that the demons are subject to you, but rejoice. Be it wasn't that you shouldn't be happy about that. He was just like, wait a minute, there's a greater joy. Your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Rejoice over that. And if nothing else, I mean, if the devil could kick your brains in every day, the one thing you can always scratch and claw your way back up and say to him, yeah, but I'm going to heaven. You can't go. Amen. Because I know where you're going. There's a place for you in the pit. Amen. Hallelujah. You got you to learn how to fight mentally with this enemy because he's going to mess with your head. Do you know that? So entrance into the, the presence of God. Hebrews 10, 19. Listen to this, man. I love this. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus and by a new and living way. Talking about that new covenant, amen. Which he, Jesus, consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh. He shed that blood for us. And I, I can come before the Father now. And I, I remember in the old days before I understood God and his love. You know, the fear of the Lord brings you to the Lord and you're still cringing. But after you get to know the Lord, he's, God is love and perfect love casts out that fear. Doesn't mean I don't have an awesome respect for him, but I'm just not always putting my lightning rod up looking for when he's going to strike me down. Because that's not, what he, that's not what he sent Jesus for, amen? But after I begin to understand and know the Lord, I, I, I figured out, wait a minute, he's my father. Now, I had a pretty good dad. You know, he didn't go around knocking me around all the time or making me afraid. We had a fairly good relationship even when I was little. And I always knew that my dad was there to protect me. Yeah. Amen. I knew my dad was a cool dad. I never had a problem walking in the house and getting in the refrigerator or grabbing out a box of cookies or whatever, except for when my mom told me you can't have them. <laughs> but, but just saying, you know, my dad took care of me. And I, I thought my dad was the baddest dude on the block, even though he's only about that tall. <laughs> he wouldn't take no guff from nobody, you know. And, and I just never, you know, I had a little bit of a fear of my dad. I knew you couldn't talk a bunch of junk to him, or to, especially to my mom. But my dad wasn't going around always trying to make me flinch and stuff. And he'd always tell me, Jim, you can do anything. You can whip anybody. You can walk on. I mean, he was like, that's how dad was, wasn't he, mom? He was always positive. And he had a saying that I really love. He'd, when I'd go out, he said, well, be careless. Well, he was meaning it in a kind of a weird way, but I always remember that, and I tell people, be careless. Don't be, don't be full of care, because your Father, your Heavenly Father, loves you, amen, and you can come boldly before His throne. You can tell God anything. Yeah. You know, you can't hide anything from God. Yeah. You know, there's sometimes, uh, not so much anymore, but, you know, in days gone by, I'll get into that flowery kind of prayer. Dear Heavenly Fathereth, <laughs> I cometh before thee today, in King James, Elizabethan hippie. And I want a theeth. It's like God's like, dude, would you just talk to me? <laughs> you know that? I mean, you got to come with respect, but, but me and God talk like normal. Sometimes I just gripe to him and go, you know what? And he always has something to say. <laughs> Not a whole lot, but he has one or two things that just kind of put you in that place. Not in a bad way, but it straightens you out. He's kind of like that old grandpa full of wisdom that, that, that's going to tell you what you need to hear, whether you like it or not. But at the same time, he's still going to pump you up and love you up. Where the devil in your own head is always going to tell you how dumb you are, how stupid you are, you can't, you won't, you never will. That's not what God does. He's going to do like my dad used to do. Why, you can do anything you put your mind to. You're a smart kid. You can do it anything. I didn't really believe it at the time, but that's what my dad thought. Amen? And that's what my Heavenly Father thinks. Glory to God. Now, some of you didn't have a dad like that. I was blessed. But you know what? If you didn't have a dad like that, you have one up there. And he lives in here by the Holy Spirit. And he, he has good thoughts towards you, the Bible says. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know my thoughts towards you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of good, thoughts of peace. I've got to expect it in for you. Amen? 
I butchered that, but go look it up. But it's that, that gist. It's like, I got good thoughts about you. I got a plan for you. I got a program for you. I got a purpose for you. Yeah. I said it again this morning. God never preserves anything that he doesn't have a purpose for. Right. Amen? Glory to God. So entrance into the, the presence of God by a new and living way. We come through the blood of Jesus, <clears throat> the blood of the new covenant. You know, when you really begin to walk by faith, but walk by the word. You know, you can walk by faith without the word, and it's not going to mean nothing. I just think God will do this. I think God will do that. Well, will he or won't he? Do you know or don't you? Well, I'm not sure. Well, then get in his word and read his word, because that's the covenant especially the New Testament, amen? People always want to go back to Torah and read Torah all the time or jump completely over into the book of Revelation. I'm telling you, you need to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and then get into Acts and Romans and First and Second Corinthians, Thessalonians, all these books yeah. that Paul and the other uh, you know, apostles wrote and get in there because they are the ones that's going to uh, unfold to you the revelation of the mystery that's no longer a mystery to you the Bible, uh, Jesus said to his disciples, and that includes us. He says, all these things of the kingdom that I speak in mysteries to other people, they're not mysteries for you. They're for you to know because you're in him. Amen. And it may take a little digging. Hey, you know, anything worth getting is worth going after and putting a little effort in. I, you know, I, that's the thing. I have a real problem. In my day, we didn't have the Internet. And I would believe God for new tapes, new books. And I always saw that the Holy Spirit brought them to me at the right time. You know, there's a lot of information you can just get gestalt with. I mean, just dumped on you that you're not emotionally or spiritually ready to get. And you can get it out there on the Internet, anything you want. It's like a candy store. In fact, most of it is candy, low calories. You know what I'm saying? Because until you get this stuff, the foundational doctrines of the Bible... That stuff out there just kind of gets your head full of knowledge. So you can go around and talk about itching ear stuff. Amen. And it's all interesting, but you should build a foundation. I'm not saying you shouldn't go out there and learn that stuff, but get a foundation first so you don't get goofy. Amen. Uh, the first thing I did when I got, got into the Word of God is I went right over to the book of Revelation. Man, I was having dreams and visions that weren't from God. They were in my own head. And I do get dreams and visions from God. Once in a while. But I'd be having the seven thunders uttering their voices in my, in my dreams and stuff. And I'd go to my mother-in-law and I'd go, there's, there's, there's revelation happening right now. And she'd go, Jim, I would really like it if you would just put revelation down, the book of Revelation for now, and go and read the Gospels. And learn about faith. Learn about, learn about these, these. Oh, but they're not exciting enough. <laughs> you know. That's what I thought. I said, okay, Mom, sure. And, uh, but, you know, she was right. Yeah. And that's why I tell, I tell young believers, you know, first of all, and pastor does too, get in the book of John, yeah. you know, and then go to the Psalms and the Proverbs and different things. But get in the book of John, get in the book of Acts, and, and work into the epistles of Paul because there's some deep stuff in there. Heard somebody talking about it today. They were, oh, I think it was you talking about reading Romans. Man, uh, next to Hebrews, Romans is like one of the deepest books there is. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's deep. Jim, how do you, do you know everything about the book of Revelation? I'll be honest with you. I've read it a bunch of times. I hit the highlights whenever I teach in times because I don't think anybody knows totally what the book of Revelation is all about. And I've heard some of the best of them, and I got some of the best books. But the best thing to do is get into the doctrines of Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. So, number four, deliverance. Now, I'm not giving you a whole lot of scripture. I'm just, I want to keep this concise, okay? Is that all right? Yeah. Colossians 1.12. I just love the Lord. I love the Word. Amen? Nobody's perfect at all this, but you know what? We can still grow in the grace and knowledge, and we can press, we can press forward. And there will be seasons in your life, if you live long enough, uh, serving the Lord, where you're really into it, and then where it's kind of like you got to force feed yourself. But I'm telling you, stick with God's Word. Stick with Him. Stick with the Holy Spirit. Okay. Colossians 1.12 says, We should be giving thanks unto the Father 
which has made us meet or has made us qualified to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Who hath, past tense, God's always speaking as if it's already a done deal. Okay, Who hath delivered us from the powers of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Now, I'm telling you, do you feel like you're up there in heaven right now? Proper? No. But you are translated in the kingdom of his dear son. It is a positional thing that's secure for you and I in heaven through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And so uh, he's delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption. We don't belong to the devil. We don't belong to the spirit of, of this world. Amen. We belong to Jesus Christ. We belong to the Father through Jesus, in whom we have redemption through his blood and even the forgiveness of sins. Listen, all my sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't go to bed at night and go, God, I know I've kind of done some stuff or thought some things or said some things, and I want you to forgive me. And if I have to make it right with somebody, I'll make it right. You know, the Bible tells us not to let, your son, let the sun go down on your wrath. You know, especially with your, with your wife or your mother or your kids. Make things right if you can that, that day. Because you, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow to them or to you. Oh, well, I'm protected by God. Yeah, you are, but, you know, stuff happens. You know, uh, think about people that, that have uh, died after having a big fight what it leaves people with you know the guilt and all that you know really when you think about it even though you're angry at the time do you want people to go through things like that do you want to go through anything like that so you know don't let the sun go down on your wrath amen but you've been delivered from the powers of darkness I mean, we could go over into Ephesians and talk about the eyes of our understanding. Ephesians 1, 18, the eyes of our understanding being light. We could go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23, how that we are the body of Christ and Satan's under our feet. We go to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6, how that we are seated positionally in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Even though we're down here on the earth, positionally in God's mind, because when he looks at you and I, he sees us all the way into the new heaven and the new earth. He knows where you're at positionally here. But, but in his mind, it's a done deal. When you receive Christ into your heart, it's a done deal. He believes you're going to make it all the way through to that point when, when you have this, this mortal put on immortality, the new creation reality from the inside to the outside, and living with him forever in, in, in eternity. Amen? When you accepted Christ, he sealed you with the Holy Spirit, the Bible says. I'm not talking about when you got baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking. In I'm talking about you can't be born again without the Holy Spirit coming into your life. I don't care if you're Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, whatever you are. If you've asked Jesus to come into your heart and you've asked him to forgive your sins and you truly got born again, new creation reality, according to 2 Corinthians 5, 17, the Holy Ghost lives in you. You may not be displaying the gifts of the Spirit or prophesying, speaking in tongues, but the minute you asked Jesus in your heart sincerely and He came into your heart and you were born again and became a new creation reality, you and the Holy Ghost are like that. It's, it's not even like, okay, He lives in this room and you live in that room. It's like you are one. And do you know that we are one in the Spirit? I mean, in God's eyes, we are connected. The body of Christ is connected. The, the, the eternal life of God runs through all of us, like, like we're connected together. I don't care what denomination we are, even though we got our little preferences and everything. If you're truly born again and in Christ, you become a new creation reality. The Holy Spirit baptizes you into the body of Christ, and by one Spirit, we are all connected. Now, if you're my br blood brother or my blood sister and we're connected in Christ and connected by blood, man, we're really close. Yes. But you know what? You and I, now I know we don't think this in our head, but in eternity we'll figure it out. Yes. If, if you have a brother or a sister or somebody that just rejects Christ and dies in their sin, and I'm telling you, you and I as, as, as born-again believers are closer than that person that yes. died without Christ. 
you're my brother, you're my sister. That's why a lot of times I think people wonder, where are you coming from? Call me brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. Because that's how I was raised in, in, in the Lord. You know, in our church, back at my mom's church, everybody's brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so. You know why? Because they're my brother and my sister. Amen. So take me by the hand, Rust Town, right? <laughs> Together. With, remember that song, Brother Nate? Russ Tapp was a great singer, wasn't he? He's still around somewhere, but man, he was bad to the bone. I was serious. He was great. Hallelujah. All right. We're getting there. We're getting there. Hang on. Number five. Huh? Well, I know that. Man, do I. I, I love Nate singing. Trust me. I love his kids singing. I love my wife singing a lot, too. Man, yeah, I tell you what, boy. When what was that song you sang again for Christmas? Oh, holy night! Oh, holy night. oh my goodness! I had, I had go thinking about it right now. I'm getting. I had goosebumps for like five minutes afterward. I went to Caleb. I go, man, your dad is awesome. I said, look at my arms, Caleb. He got a big old smile on his face. Amen. Yeah, he's like, yeah, that's my dad. <laughs> Praise God. I mean, he didn't say that, but that was the kind of look he gave me. <laughs> Caleb don't say a whole lot. He just gives you the looks. <laughs> I'm sure he was thinking it because he had that smile. Either that or he was thinking, oh, he ain't that great. I'm better. <laughs> you should hear me play and everything. I don't know. It looked like he was thinking that his dad was hot stuff. <laughs> what are you laughing at, Jordy? You think your dad's hot stuff too, don't you? Deliverance. <laughs> well, we're up. We're past deliverance. We're going to a clean conscience now. Hebrews nine fourteen. Do you know if your conscience is bothering you and you have a long list? How many ever get the long list? You know, I remember when I was backslidden for a while and came back to God. The first thing I did when I was really seriously thinking about getting all right and coming back and everything, I started giving him the list. Oh, I'm still doing that. I'm still thinking this, and I need to get this taken care of, and then I'll come back. And it was like, come to me today or else, just like you are. Amen? I didn't have no plea. God was saying, today is the day of salvation. You know, I, when I was backslidden for a while, I would lay in bed at night sometimes and just go, God, can I come home? Please bring me home, God. I'm, I want to come home. You remember, you remember that, right? And you're like, God, I'm sorry. And yeah, when I wake up in the morning, I'm going to be good, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to not do that. And I'm, it never worked. Come on. Never worked. And, uh, but that, that day when I, I was serious, and God knew I had it up to here, then I started giving him all these things. Like, well, yeah, i got to wait till I quit doing this and quit thinking that. And then God's like, no, just like you are. Yeah. Amen. Because you can't deliver yourself. And you can't cleanse your conscience. Only God can do that. Hebrews 9, 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself up without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Now, I know he's speaking to the Hebrews here, but it goes for us too. We're always trying to you know, approve ourselves before God. And, of course, they were in a system of works and law. Amen. And we can still step over in that. Sometimes, even though I know what I know, I still get caught up in the legalism of the gospel at times. And there really isn't no legalism in the gospel. We, we turn it around and we, we make all these conditions for ourselves. And I'm not saying we should just, you know, hang loose and do what we want. But at the same time, I'm approved of God through Jesus Christ. Now, because I'm approved of God through Jesus Christ by, no, uh, by nothing that I can do, that should, that should inspire me to want to do what I can do and live out of my new creation reality because the Bible says that I'm the very righteousness of God through Christ, but my righteousness is as filthy rags. You know, the Bible tells us 2 Corinthians 5, 21, I quote it all the time, He, Jesus, was made to be sin who knew no sin that you and I might become the righteousness of God through Him. And so my righteousness is based on Him and the blood that He shed for me. 
And, and that doesn't mean my conscience doesn't bother me when I do things wrong or think wrong. That's, that's a small list. And it'll, usually the Holy Spirit will nail you for one or two things. And he does it in that grandfatherly way, you know, father knows best kind of way. It's not this, oh, I can't believe you did that again. Oh, I don't know if I can, if I can make things right between you and the Lord. You're just, a, you're just a failure. That's not what he does. He goes, come on, son. Get in my word. Come on. Don't let those, cast down those imaginations. Put those things down. Remember, everything that you have, everything that you are able to overcome is through me. It's through the blood. Amen? And and then you go, that just sounds too easy. (laughs) Well, it's easy for what he did. But it's hard for us sometimes to get that through our heads. Come on, you all know what I'm talking about. We can preach this stuff, I preach this stuff, you you read the books on righteousness and all this kind of stuff, but still there's this little nagging voice in the back of your brain that says, something's just not right about you. Well, you know, as long as you're living in this flesh, something's just not right about you. And you you need to just be okay with that, but not stay like that. You know, be okay that you are, you are a, a changed person on the inside living in a body that's still capable of doing crazy things. And take authority over it. I don't do what I used to do. You know what I mean? There's things that, that before I just did. I never had a conscience about it. I just did it. If I felt like it, I did it. You know, that isn't to say that once in a while, especially if you're not staying tuned up in the Lord that something stupid don't come in your brain. But you know what? Temptation is not sin. Temptation is just temptation to tempt you to sin. And if you don't sin, and if you push it aside and say, "Uh -uh, I ain't doing that. I ain't that person no more. Amen? And then even if you do goof up, then you go, I'm sorry, God, here I am again. But don't kick yourself for a week. Accept the blood, accept the cleansing, and start all over again. Amen? Amen? Come on, church. And we need, we, need to, we need to help people that don't understand this. And man, that's why I'm preaching it tonight. I, it, this helps me too. Where are we at? We're getting close. We're getting close. We're going to try to get out of here by 730, Lord willing. Amen. So we have a clean conscience through the blood of Jesus. And we don't have to serve God in dead works anymore like Oh, I've got to be good enough to pray. (laughs) Some of my best sermons, some of the most anointed prayer lines I've ever had was after I was a jerk that day. Now, I don't don't encourage you to be a jerk so you can have a good prayer line or a good sermon. but, But what my point is, is when I recognize by the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and I said, here I am again, I'm messed up. I am so weak, God, sometimes. And he's like, okay, in your weakness, I can be strong. And, and the cool thing about God, it's the goodness of God that leads you to repentance. Because all of a sudden, he anoints you. You have a great service. Uh, you know, God blesses you with something. And you're like, I totally don't deserve it. And he's like, I know you don't, but, but Jesus paid the price. Amen. And you're my child. And I know, I know my thoughts towards you, and I know the end result. Come on. Amen? Just keep walking with Jesus. Don't give up. Amen? All right, number six, cleansing, reconciliation, and forgiveness. And we've kind of talked about all this, but here's some, here's some more scriptures. All right, 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light, what light? The light of God's word, the revelation that we have in God's word, amen? If we will walk in the light of this, the word is a lamp unto my feet. The more knowledge of God's word I have, the, the better and stronger the light is before me, Amen? I, thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Is that Psalms 119 something or other? Amen. Hallelujah. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Notice how he kind of lumps us all together here. You know, uh, walking and living for the Lord isn't as fun doing it all by yourself. That's why I was talking about the monks up on a mountain. I get it, but I don't really see how, you know, hiding up in a, in a cloistered place up on top of a mountain, you know, maybe for a while. But, you know, God wants us down here 
working and doing things among God's people. There's always time. You can make time for God. Um, but you, you know what? You've got to interact with people. Yeah, I've known ministers in the past. They want to get up on, especially evangelists that are in these big, back in the old days anyway. They, they wanted to be ushered out real quick. They didn't want to have, other than the prayer line a little bit, they didn't want to talk with people. And I remember going to, um, what was that church, Billy Joe? Victory, before Billy Joe died, him and his wife, Sharon. There's like thousands of people there. They would pick, and, and it was at the Maybe Center, Oral Roberts University, before they got their own church. But there was like all kinds of exit places. But every week, they would go to a different exit and stand there and shake hands with everybody coming out of the church. I mean, you know, even though it was a giant church, they tried to get hands on with as many people as they could. I'll never forget uh, Brother Billy Joe, he was, he was a good man. Uh, and he was one time in a service, and he was, he was uh, getting ready to pray for everybody, and he was down among the crowd, and some guy didn't like something. I guess he helped this guy's wife get born again or something, and he didn't like it. This man walked right up and clocked Billy Joe. I mean, busted his head open. Bleed, you know, like when boxers hit each other up here and split their... And Billy Joe kind of fell back, and his dudes were ready to jump this guy. And he's like, no, 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 man. And he just, he just smiled, Jesus loves you, man. I forgive you. And he went on and just continued to minister. Now, I don't know if I'd do that. <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure I would be that sanctified, but I, I was like, my gosh, there, there is a real man of God, a real pastor. Took it on the chin, just like the Bible says. And you know... Uh, I, I think he gained, you know, some people would be in pride and think, oh, man, everybody thinks I'm a punk now. No, man, everybody thought big time of him. And that guy was lucky because there was probably plenty of uh, guys that weren't quite regenerated and sanctified that would have caught him and beat him senseless. But he wasn't going to allow that. And man, I, I just respected that, man. He was a good man. All right. Uh, a clean conscience. Cleansing, reconciliation, and forgiveness. So if we walk in the light, so you got to walk in the light, amen? amen, and walk walk in the light with your brothers and sisters. Colossians 1.20, and having made peace through his blood, the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him, I say, whether they be things in the earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he re reconciled you. In the body of his flesh through his death to present, listen to this, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. You know, Romans chapter 8, verse 1 says, There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, I think there's a caveat there, but it stops right there, and then it, go, it continues on those who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Learning to walk after the Spirit. But first and foremost, there's no condemnation. So because of that, we want to learn how to walk in the Spirit. Amen? I tell you all the time, Pentecost isn't about speaking in tongues or all the miracles, this, that, and the other. True Pentecost is about the leadership of the Holy Spirit in your life. Him having uh, ascendancy in all areas of your life. Glory to God. And that, that takes time. you got to learn to walk with the Lord. All right? Now, Number seven, protection from the wrath to come. This is one I like the best. <clears throat> Exodus 12, 12, 13, if you're taking notes. And the blood shall be for you a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Pastor brought that up today. 1 Thessalonians 1, 10. We are to wait for his son from heaven. So here we're in the waiting place right now. We're in the holding pattern. And we're waiting for Jesus to come. And we're looking. I don't know about you, but I'm looking for Jesus to come. I, I'm, I'm going to be shocked if he don't come in the next 10 years. Maybe even in the next five years. As crazy as it's getting. Some of you, I don't know if you hear it, you got this little, this little mini Mao out there in, in, uh, in North Korea talking about how he's going to nuke the United States and South Korea. And, and you got China raising their head and Iran and all these people with these Mega weapons, do you understand? The, the, they're not Hiroshima-type weapons. And, and, and they could just totally wipe the whole earth out. But you know what? My Bible, you know what gives me peace? Has for years and years. My Bible doesn't say that's what's going to happen. 
Will there be a nuke or two here and there? Probably. But the whole world is not going to be wiped out by that while we're here. We are a restraining factor. I know they don't like us, some people. But I'm telling you right now, they, they, if they understood, they'd be thanking God that the Christians were here on this earth. Because us with the Holy Spirit have a restraining factor. God is not going to allow us to totally be annihilated. Now, I'm not saying some Christians ain't going to die for their faith, because they do. Amen? But as a rule, God is not going to let the devil wipe us all out. And, and in that he's not going to let him wipe us out, these other people are, the, you know, the rain falls on the just and the unjust, so does the blessing. Because, you know, it's kind of hard to, when you got your people integrated in with everybody, it's kind of hard to hit and miss, you know. So these crazy people, they're talking a lot of smack. Yes, we're going to destroy the United States and yada, yada. And you know what? The United States is doing a pretty good job on their own. <laughs> Just saying. And the, Are you saying we're never, I don't know. You know, we could be attacked. All kinds of stuff could happen. But I say, if we pray, because if my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, uh, turn from their wicked ways, huh? And seek my face. I'll hear from heaven and heal their land. Well, maybe it won't be our whole government, but while we're here, bless God, and while we're here in Hutchinson, no, stupid devils don't get to come in here and just run roughshod. Amen? And you need to start binding them more. Well, you know, my neighborhood, I know there's in sporadic ways there's people acting up and acting out. But you know what? I say in Jesus' name as watchmen and watchwomen in this town, no. You know, there'll be, there'll be less people getting, well, nobody's getting abortions here in town anymore. And we're not going to let that happen again. Amen? Amen? We have to stand against that. I, I really, truly believe a lot of bad weather goes around us because Hutchinson years and years ago kicked out the abortion uh, people out of this town. I remember I was right when I first moved here. I could name the doctor's names, but anyway, not going to do that. But they're out. Yeah. Amen? Right. Heinous. But is there crazy stuff? Yeah, there is, but you know what? As long as me and you are here and we pray and pray over this town, there will be less of it than there will be in other places. That's what I believe. Amen. We're a gate church, too. We may be a small church, but we carry some weight in the spirit right here. Well, you're just kind of small. I don't care. God doesn't have to have a, a big group of people. God just has to have knowledgeable people that will bow their knee to him and pray. Amen. All right. Protection from the wrath to come. So we got to wait for a son that's coming from heaven. First, you should write this one down when everybody goes, well, you know you're going to go through the tribulation. First off, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 says, I'm not appointed unto his wrath, but to obtain salvation. Amen. By our Lord Jesus Christ. Number eight, healing through his blood. Pastor talked about this some today too. Psalms 129, verse 3. The plowers have plowed upon my back. Now, this was before this happened to Jesus in prophecy in, in Psalms. The plowers have plowed upon my back. What was that? Amen. When he got whipped, uh, they plowed upon my back. They made long, long their furrows. Isaiah 53, 4 and, and 5. Surely he's borne our griefs. That's our sicknesses and diseases our griefs, and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we were healed. We were healed. We are healed. What do you mean? Well, I'm healed in here first. My broken, uh, separated spirit has been reconciled back unto God through the blood of Jesus Christ. And there's a healing that took place in here. And then there's also provision for supernatural healing and supernatural recovery. Not all healing comes just like that. But you know what? When we lay hands on the sick, if they'll believe by faith and we are in agreement, they will recover. But what about the ones that don't? Then God, ha He's ready to take them home. I prayed for a lot of people uh, and believed with all my heart till the last breath they took that God would do a miracle, and yet they went home to be with Jesus. And the minute they got to heaven, guess what? They were healed. I've told this story a lot, but my mother-in-law one time told me, she goes, 
when my husband, Lori's dad, at 43, was in the hospital, he had aneurysms, okay, and he was between life and death. My mother-in-law is a faith woman. I'm telling you, there have been many uh, documented cases where she prayed for people and their heart was healed or they got healed of cancer or whatever, right? And, and my mother-in-law told me, she says, Jim, I prayed so hard. I prayed with all my heart, and she said, the Lord spoke to me and said, I'm going to heal your husband at 12 o'clock. She's like, oh, praise the Lord. 12 o'clock, he died, exactly. And she's like, why, God? She, God said, he's healed. He's with me. Well, that kind of stunk for her and the kids, but, you know, God still fulfilled his word. So sometimes, you know, when people get taken home, God healed them ultimately. Well, I don't like that. Well, I don't like it either, but it does happen. I've seen it happen. And I know that I prayed my heart out, and so did the other pastors and people in here. But when it's, when it's their time, it's their time. And you say, well, I know it's not the perfect will of God, but we're in the permissive will of God right now a lot. Amen? And in the permissive will of God, stuff happens. You know, people's choices can also make things happen for you and I. Man, you know, you got the lovely little family driving to church in the morning, all happy-go-lucky, the little kids and everybody are all nice and their hair's all nice with ribbons. Some drunk creep comes across the medium. That wasn't the perfect will of God. God didn't do that. Amen? That person made a choice to go out and drink. Your choices hurt people or bless people. Their choices hurt or bless you at times. That's why you want to always pray. I, get, I don't get on my motorcycle that I don't go, God, protect me when I get on that crazy thing. I'm about ready to get rid of it anyway. I'm getting, I'm getting a little scared the older I get on that thing. It weighs 825 pounds, and man, I tell you, it's scary. I think could crawl up a wall. Mm. <laughs> just saying, you know, I'm not as crazy as I used to be. My mom will just dance a jig if I get rid of it. Get rid of that. Every time I go out there, she goes, it's too cold to ride that thing. Yeah. <laughs> the wind. The wind's blowing out there. Why don't you take your car? <laughs> well, you know, if you understood that my mother-in-law lost her brother on a motorcycle and her, her nephew, her twin sister's nephew, both died on motorcycles. So she kind of got a reason. I've never been able to get her on the back of it with me. My mother-in-law would have got on, though. <laughs> All right. One time, twice, got on twice. So healing by his blood. Number nine, we only got one more after this and we're done. The new life for the Christian and the internal fellowship we have with God. John six fifty four, and we did this this morning. Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. And boy, I'll tell you what, the folks that were following him went tilt. But he was speaking by the Spirit, and he was talking about the new covenant that he was going to make in his blood, and that he was going to give his flesh for all of us. Amen. And so... Uh, we have a new life because of the blood of Jesus. And we've partaken of Jesus. And this morning, we partook of the elements and the symbology of the Last Supper. Amen. And there is a, it's not just a ritual we do. There is a spiritual connotation to it. Amen. There's a mystery in that. All right. The most expensive exchange rate ever. The blood is the most expensive exchange rate. Acts 20, 28, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to feed the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. 1 Peter 1, 18, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversations received by the tradition of your fathers, but you were purchased with the precious blood of Christ, the Messiah, like like that of a sacrificial lamb without spot or blemish. Amen? The eternal blood of Jesus Christ. Do you love the Lord? Amen. Amen. Well, you heard a good message this morning about the covenant. You got to hear a Bible study on the blood of Jesus tonight. I want you to know that we should thank God every day for the blood. And now that you understand this, when you go, I plead the blood, 
you'll understand and the demons will understand that you know what you're talking about. Amen. That you're not just taking something you heard some old saint say, but you understand the covenant you have through Jesus Christ and that his blood uh, gives you the authority to say, you know what, devil? I plead the blood. Well, you know, you're a bad person. You've done this. I don't care. I plead the blood of Jesus. I have forgiveness and reconciliation through his blood. And by the way, I command you in the name of Jesus to come out and go. Yes, men. That's right. You don't need to be afraid of them. Come on. Amen? Yeah, when you know the blood, and when you know that the word of God has given you authority over them, Amen. and when you say, I plead the blood over my house, Something happens in the spirit. Something happens and demons go, you know what? We can't go in there. He pleaded blood over his house. Have you ever walked around your, the perimeter of your house and plead the blood? You better do it every once in a while. Oh, well, you know that. Don't. Yeah, it does. Works for me. I'm serious. And when things start getting crazy with my kids and around the house, it's like I'm going to walk. I plead the blood. I bind you, devil. This is my house. Yes. You're not welcome here. Yes. You know what? When I was a younger Christian, for some reason, probably because of what I did before I got saved, devils used to come visit me in my house. They don't come in my house anymore. Or if they do, they do it sneakily. <laughs> Amen? Because I'm not afraid of them, and I know the power of the blood. I know I'm no match for them in and of myself, but I know in whom I believed in, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I commit to him under the power of that blood. Can you say amen? And that's just not me, you know, crowing just to crow. I'm telling you, I believe that. Amen. And I have had my share of experiences with demons. And let me tell you, even, even at times when I really wasn't where I thought I should be, when I told them to go, they went. Amen. amen? Hallelujah. You love the Lord? Praise God. Anybody need prayer tonight?